Previously on Foundation, Season 2, Episode 2. The Cleons are crumbling. Will day break the cycle from dawn to dusk? What'd you think about today's episode, Foundation, Season 2, Episode 3? I give the Episode 3 a 5 out of 10. Ooh, pretty low rating. I was kind of annoyed with this episode. Production values, acting, everything, the art, fantastic. But the story felt a little... I don't know, felt a little slow to me. So Gal and Salvor on Una's world felt a little silly, like they didn't do much. And they were sort of wandering around and saying things to each other. I, I wanted more heaviness to that. And Gal, Salvor, and Harry seemed to throw just sort of quips and one-liners at each other without really communicating. Kind of that, another reason why it felt kind of silly. Uh, I wanted to see more of Bel Rios as a general and less about his personal life. That's just me. Like, I want to see how it impacts the story, because he's a famous general, a competent general. And his personal life is, you know, it's on the sidelines. But it got felt kind of flipped to me. I'm still thinking about the Invictus. That's sitting there next to the Foundation. I don't know how long it's been now. It is What's the situation? Is that just going to come out of left field coming up? I think it's important. I'm not sure. Uh, we are getting some more information about the Outer Reach and the Foundation, which is good. I think I want more of it. I'm still not getting enough. And again, great production, acting, artwork, all of it. Great. I just struggling with the story right now. What do you think? I gave this episode a seven out of ten, which is you know pretty good for me. There were some fun scenes that were kind of goofy and silly, which was a weird pacing, weird weird mood for the foundation. Um, but I mean, it was, they were fun. On the other hand, there were draw dropping scenes. There were there were scenes like the the Empire fleet jumping, and also that that head to head showdown between Empire and and Bell Rios. Fantastic, fantastic scenes. And there's an interesting setup that's being well set up between Bell Rios and Hober Mallow. I'm supposed to root for Hober Mallow, but as of now, I, Bell Rios is such a cool character. I, I want him to win. And, and I wonder, I wonder who, how many more people are going to get chemically charisma uh, like we see Hober Mallow towards the end of the episode. And this could be this could be the religious girl's like her calling card of just just injecting people. Super fun. Mm-hmm. Let's get into today's discussion. Let's do it. Foundation Season 2, Episode 3. So we'll start off with a clip of a description of psychohistory, which I liked and didn't like at the same time. Let's watch. There may be infinite ways to arrive at the inevitable. So I like the idea of there being infinite ways or infinite trajectories through time for it to arrive at a particular point. I wouldn't use the word inevitable, though, because is anything inevitable? I mean, if we're going to arrive to a particular crisis in psychohistory, that's the highest probability avenue, but not the only probability, not the not 100% probability. So I wouldn't describe it as inevitable, but I like the idea of there being an infinite number of paths. That seems to be like a really good description of psychohistory to me. Right. I really like this. I think we made an, a mountain analogy, like below a mountain, there's a field and there's lots of different ways you can go through the field. But eventually, you're going to go to the mountain pass between the big old mountains because you got to get through. That suggests like an inevitability, but that's not really true because you, you could climb over a mountain. Mm-hmm. So it seems strange that Harry Seldon, creator of psychohistory, would say that there are inevitabilities because that means that things have to happen a certain way, but or, or you just have to happen at all. But really, he should say things are very likely, very high probability, mm-hmm. but nothing truly ever is inevitable. So so good, good that he considers. Lots of different possibilities, but also strange. Also strange that he says inevitable. It's really strange that he says inevitable. And in fact, some of the crises have not come to pass the way he predicted. Um, that would mean not inevitable. So, yeah, interesting description uh, by Harry here. Man, Harry, he, he really upset me because at this point in time, he is in control of the beggar. He's in, he's in, he, he has complete control over its piloting. Why, why, why did he land here? <laughs> why? Look how far away they are. It's, it's basically like a, hey, F you, Gail, carry me. Like, cause, cause, <laughs> what? He's like a hologram. He doesn't even feel it. Like, there's only, there's only one set of footsteps. Mm-hmm. Like, he doesn't feel the pain of walking through the desert. Why did you make Gail do this? That's right. And it's, it's desert. It's hot. It's hot. Dehydration. Food problems. Plus, this just doesn't look like easy terrain. You got to go up and down and around. What, and what, what? You, what, what? You, have, you have a spaceship. <laughs> And some of the places, there's it's like a thin crust that could collapse in That's down right. in the robots. Land on top of the rocks. What are you doing? What are we doing? The sand? <laughs> why, why are we walking? We have a ship. He's like the super smart AI, but then this? <laughs> what, what, what? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Weird. 
the Harry hate continues. He like <laughs> he is he like has this master plan, but he doesn't share it with people until it's convenient, until it's right right now. Like like look at this. You agreed Ignis was crucial for the second foundation. So is this. Since when? Since the Radiant required it. It doesn't design travel itineraries. It sure. does now. There's a place in those mountains about 500 meters from here which it requires me to visit. <laughs> well, why hide? Why hide the plan? Why hide the plan? And if you know it's 500 meters, just, just land there. <laughs> what, what, what are you doing, Harry? And if you have control of the ship and you want to go somewhere... You're going. That's right. Well, he, doesn't need, need he doesn't need their permission. Just do it. Just, Just do, do it. it. <laughs> I'm going to A. It's like I'm going to B. That's right. He didn't Why? Even, he didn't even take him to the planet that he said he would. <laughs> Why? <laughs> yeah. So weird. He's just he's just doing it for shits and giggles at this point. I mean, he must be. Okay, that's not the last one, though. He, he does it again when he says the planet's uninhabited. Stay alert while we're gone. Why? The planet's uninhabited. Uninhabited doesn't mean we're alone. Like, what does that mean? I thought it meant that there was going to be, like, monsters, like, biological monsters attacking or, them. Or ghosts or some shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, like, yeah, like, a bunch of AI robots running around. Like, what does that mean? Why, why doesn't he just tell them? There might be robots outside. Watch out, robots. Yeah. Just, just tell me that. How big are the robots? I don't want to tell you. I don't want to tell, tell you. So are they little robots? They big? I don't tell you. I don't know. I don't, You're I don't not know. alone. I don't tell you. It's uninhabited, but you're not alone. What? Harry, Harry. <laughs> what? Sa same team here, Harry. <laughs> Work with me. Just tell me. What? Just, yeah. What? Why, why be cryptic? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. A win for the foundation. They say something about psychohistory, which I quite like. It is a landscape that sometimes narrows into a dangerous mountain pass that can't be avoided. That's why we call it a crisis. So I, I really like this landscape analogy with the mountain pass, because if a crisis is sitting at the mountain pass, there's all these possibilities before you get to the mountain of how to get to the mountain pass. Once you get to the mountain pass, you have to go through the mountain pass. So all of these, if the landscape is how you move through time as a civilization, the mountain pass can represent a crisis mm -hmm. where most of the paths converge to a single event or a single area that is almost the same event hmm. really like that i like that in terms of the show's interpretation of psychohistory although i think in terms of the book's interpretation of psychohistory there needs to be other mountain passes also some people that just climb directly over the mountain they do it the hard way but but this seems a little bit of a naive interpretation because it's like you don't have to go to the mountain pass you could also just turn around but i do like this i like that in that there's they're considering lots of different possibilities Whereas in the in Foundation season two episode one, they portrayed it like it was portrayed like a single path of a single fork, and then this red path has all these other red paths. Um, I like this very good. The only objection I have here is that he says the essential part of the crisis is the fact that there's a single mountain pass for all the trajectories to go through. I don't know if that necessarily means it's a crisis. That could just mean a turning point, like the Foundation has to move from agriculture to solar power. Like, not a crisis, but it will happen because the all the paths converge. Say um, all the paths converge to everyone in Foundation wins the lottery. Like, that's not a crisis. Like, <laughs> not, not a crisis. <laughs> pretty good, right? Yeah. So I guess the crisis is the mountain pass plus some turning point event hmm. that makes it a crisis. So hmm. interesting, we're getting conflicting descriptions in the show about what is psychohistory? Is it this many trajectories situation or is it dependent on special people like salvor or gale it's unclear it's interesting I right into this next one next mm -hmm. video yeah was salvor special i think there's their conflict there's conflict in the foundation of her whether she was like a special human or just a regular person right Seldon knew that in his first crisis, success would require action. And the action we took at that time had a name, Silver Hardy. And if Harry said... So, so that description makes Salvor not sound special. That the Foundation was going to take some action and Salvor was the one that stepped up. It just happened we, to be there. Just happened to be there. Which is kind of against what we learned about Salvor in Season 1, where she has the special luck ability, where she could flip a coin and always tell you what it's going to land on. And also the, the null field for the vault didn't affect her as much as other people. Yeah. So that, that makes her seem special. So let's continue here. 
Sheldon had engraved the name Salvo Hard in somewhere at that time, you'd have a point. So how Hober Mallow gets his name shouted from the vault and, and they and, vaporize and, a guy for some and, reason. And written on the vault. Oh, and written on the vault, yeah, as well. Salvor didn't get that. So does that mean she's not special anymore? Does the specialness come up in different ways for each crisis? Uh, did people in the past believe Salvor was special, but now these traitors are like, whatever, I don't care. No, it's not That's special. Right. So because because the religious guy is the only one that was there that witnessed the event. Mm -hmm. And so over time, I think the foundation, the people of Foundation have become less religious and less believing in what happened. So they may see Salvor Harden as just kind of a normal person. And the only special person is this Hover Mallow. Right. So it's kind of unclear. Is Salvor special or not? Or is it she was special? People don't believe it anymore. Yeah, kind of interesting. Hmm. Harry goes on later to say a statement which I think is accurate to what has psychohistory is stated. I intended one psychohistorian to be on Terminus. You seem to think you're very indispensable. No, at enough scale, I am insignificant. I like it. So, so psychohistory needs him at the very beginning because they needs him to start the foundations, to, to start the missions to go out there. But that over time, it should not depend on any particular person. Psychohistory is supposed to be this idea of you can predict where a herd of people go, but you can't predict the actions of one, any one person. And so it should not depend on any one person. And so even Harry, the person that created psychohistory, should not be significant in the long run. Right, so I like as, this. as time goes on, as more people enter the equation, as more volume of space enters the equation, then the, it diminishes the importance of one person. It sounds great. Sounds great. Yeah. Still weird that Salvor and Gail and Hauber Mallow are special because that seems to contradict what he just said. But I still think it's, it's, it still holds true for them as time goes on and volume goes up and they will become less significant. Yeah. This is an interesting scene. So they have these salt flats. I think they call them polesque mines in, mm -hmm. the, in the show. I don't know what a polesque is. They, they look like salt flats. Mm -hmm. So it seemed strange to me that with all the technology and the power that the Empire has at its fingertips, why are they sending people to do this manual labor? I mean, at least give them machinery. I mean, if you really want the salt mm -hmm. off this planet, then, then, then harvest it. Do it. Yeah, it's kind of weird that they they have the tech these big machines and amazing ships and i assume mining tech to just hire people and get this these resources very efficiently and just house the people in a in a prison normal prison that seems yeah. like it would be more efficient than this slow process of like manual labor very weird 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 maybe maybe this isn't an essential resource and they're just having them mine something that's arduous to mine and then throwing it away <laughs> i don't know why they would do that i mean gosh that would be that would be in line with the empire i guess mm -hmm. actually right like you make yeah. people do painful labor mm -hmm. or something that's tortuous and then right before you're ready to kill them you say oh yeah we just actually just wash this away anyway like yeah, it doesn't matter. we just made you suffer you just made you suffer yeah okay even okay. there just make just torture them just torture them what are you doing what's with the what's with the idea that they're actually doing something that's right I guess that is some form of like... You give people hope and then you break yeah. it? Like accomplish something. Actually, it's like you didn't accomplish anything. Maybe. I don't know. It's very interesting. It seems strange. Yeah. Who is this person? Mm. This is Callie, the mathematician from thousands of years ago. So it, it, should, it can't be the same person. But but who 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 or what is this? What what What... What do you think? Yeah, Harry did say something about she helped create psychohistory. Does that mean she's a person from the past? Does that mean she's some kind of AI robot thing? Right. So my, my thoughts was were maybe she's the uh, the second remaining intelligent robot. Okay. Maybe she's the first of her kind, an AI construct, like purely purely created on its own, like purely software. Purely software. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then it's taking the form of Callie. Mm -hmm. um, maybe Callie was a brilliant mathematician and wanted to prolong her life into the future. So she figured out how way to capture her consciousness into code. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe maybe that 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 this is what we're looking at. And and she also taught Harry how to do it for the Prime Radian. Um, yeah, maybe um, that would be consistent with she doesn't have a pulse. And but later on, Harry does. Um, I don't know. I don't know what Callie is. 
Yeah, and I guess psychohistory couldn't have just popped out of nowhere. It has to be based on mathematicians and scientists of the past. And she could be one of them, the most brilliant one. Yeah. But then again, super unclear. So many questions. I don't know. And then, and then her body right here. Is this, is, this her, is this an actual body or is this a robot or is this a hologram or... What is this? Great question. Blown wide open. And mm. I think by the end of the episode, we leave the planet. So hopefully we'll mm. find out the answer somehow. I hope. And even if it is like a human person right here, mm. there's still a possibility that she was, she has the possibility of manufacturing a human body and then implanting herself in the body. So she looks totally human. Yeah. And then, you know. Ooh, that would explain Harry at the end when he's alive. Maybe she can generate bodies and then she implanted Harry's programming right. into that body. Right. And maybe the foundation forgot how to do that kind of technology. Sure. Yeah. Could have or, been outlawed, should have been could have been forbidden. Yeah, who knows? Know. Yeah. So many possibilities for what the heck's going on here. Intriguing. Yeah. This is super fun. Super fun introduction to Hober Mallow. Like I thought he would be a warrior or a religious person or a traitor. Actually, he's kind of a scoundrel. He's like mm. he's a traitor, but he scams people. And so he does this teleportation trick. Now, the thing that I did not like about it, it was it, it was pretty goofy. Like, why? Why, why, why? why would a leader of a civilization be like, test this experimental teleportation on me? Like, he's got tons of, of servants and underlings, like, test it on them. Right. And we could, well, why not he test it on them and then I stay in power if that person dies or it is a trick. Kind of whatever. Kind of whatever. It's not a big deal. Super S weird. Super weird that, yeah, that he used himself. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, I was thinking, why does Hober Mallow, if he has a supply of this thing, these things that he's selling to this empire or, or whoever this is, I assume he's going to use it with his soldiers and his police officers and all kinds of stuff. So he's going to need a lot of them. So Hober Mallow could give him the the first one for free. Yep. And then he can test it on as many soldiers as he likes, as many people as he likes. Once he's satisfied, you know, you sell the supplies and everybody makes money. He's happy. Yes, the sales pitch was very strange. <laughs> very strange. <laughs> kind of goofy, but okay, we got okay. Homer Mallow into the story now. Yeah. This spoken showdown. This was so cool. This is this is between Bell Rios and 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 Day. Do you think to strike me? Strike you? I'd like to rip your fucking head off. Okay. Go ahead. I took an oath. Like bark. Strike me. No. Strike me or I kill your husband. You're my emperor. What answer am I looking for? Do I want you to strike me so I know I can control you by threatening your husband? Or do I want you to refrain to show that you will protect empire at all cost? One of these choices buys you everything. One sends you back to the mines a widower. Ooh, what a head to head. And it's like aggressive in your face, but also mind games. Oof, I did not know what to do. Yeah, I mean, it is a catch-22. If you obey the Empire, obey Empire, then you strike Empire, therefore hurting Empire. But if you disobey Empire, well, then you've disobeyed Empire. There's no win. There's no win. Mm -hmm. So means there's no right answer and there's no wrong answer. Right? Right. What an absolutely terrifying force the Empire is. Mm -hmm. You just, you don't know what to read. Like, I, like what do I do around you? Right. Yeah. And the conclusion is disobedience is loyalty and loyalty is disobedience yeah and obedience is disloyalty it's, it's anything goes yeah anything goes and, and nothing goes yeah so <laughs> I, I love i love how day does this to people yeah just puts them in no win scenarios so that yep. they can they either crumble or don't <laughs> yep Whew. Uh, so this was just a line in one of the scenes, and I was like, what? Yeah. My dad used to say, never let your sense of morals prevent you from doing what's right. Can you break that down for us? Break it down. So, so if you have a sense of morals, and that guides you how to move through the world in a moral manner, then if you ignore it, and you say this other thing is right, shouldn't you just revise your sense of morals to take into account that new information. And secondly, if you determined that an action is was deemed immoral by your moral sense, but you determine it to be moral, aren't you what what moral basis are you using to to support that? You're using a hidden 
moral sense of morality. Mm -hmm. So we've got all kinds of twists and turns here where, like, update your sense of morality to take into account the new information. Let's make it a, let's make it a concrete example. Let's say, like, it's against my morals to kill person A, but person A is going to kill person B and C. So if my morals say to, to oh, the more important thing is to save B and C, then I'm going to kill A. But isn't that still right and along my morals? Like, 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 I said don't kill, so you don't kill A. But I'm going to kill A to break my morals because I have another moral that says save B and C. I said don't kill. But both actions, killing or not killing, are both inside my morals. That's right. So my statement of don't kill needs to be updated that I can kill in defense of others. Right. If I blindly follow that sense of morality, then... I, I, I mean, how can I even say saving B and C is a right call unless it's already a part of my morals? That's right. That's right. <laughs> so I think what Salvor's dad was trying to say here is you have this ingrown sense of emotional morality that gives you like disgust or like, I don't like that. But sometimes you need to use your logical reasoning part of your brain to overcome that emotion. Other times you think something's logically right and your gut says, ah, oh, that doesn't feel right. So sometimes the emotion needs to override. So I think what Salvor's dad was saying is listen to both. Okay. Maybe. He just made it a cryptic message a instead. Cryptic. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. So this civilization, it's it's supposed to be fascist. Mm -hmm. So like everyone's wearing drab colors. There's no liveliness to the culture. Mm -hmm. All the women are oppressed with this largely covering their bodies, mm -hmm. everything except their face. And all the, the men and some of the women are also just military. And they have these public executions, just just ob objectionable, just just bad. You're not supposed to. You're just supposed to be be good for people. At the same time, like it's super fun. <laughs> like you got this like bumblebee, like target, like right here. Like yeah. it's all like puffy, and puffy and goofy, goofy. and like, <laughs> so whoosh, so, like poke through the middle. Like super fun. I mean, it's like, a terrible public execution, but it's kind of fun. I I mean, honestly, I like them. I like them. Yeah, I'd go to that public execution and cheer them on mm -hmm. until the blood started. I think it'd be a good time. It'd be a good time. <laughs> Having fun with everyone else. This was weird. So we go to this planet and um, Hober Mallow and the two clerics. religious clerics, they're taking off. Once they get past the small arms fire, there's no more planetary defense. Let's good. watch. Now they're off home free. <laughs> 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 once, once they got past the little guns. There are no, the like, there's no, like, lasers or missiles or, or cannons. Like, we got past stuff. these little guards. Like, we're good. Yeah, we're good. Once once you get past, yeah. Like, this fascist military culture, like, really only anticipated people, like, shooting with guns. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There's nothing in orbit. There's no ships. There's no fighters. There's no gun emplacements. Like, what? what, what? And also, look at this building. Look at this building. This building is a little suspect here. Okay. So, we've got testic testicle one. Testicle two, and clearly a shaft. Clearly a shaft. Can't unsee it now. Can't unsee it. Can't unsee it. You're welcome. Yeah. Maybe this is a cannon. Ah. Pop, 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 pop. I shoot up into the sky. Mm -hmm. It shoots humiliation. Jesus. <laughs> All right. So over Mal is trying to. Trying, he's super charming. He's super charismatic. He tries to talk his way off the ship. I need but, John Terminus. But the strongest type of charisma is chemical charisma. I need John Terminus. I'm not going to Terminus. You're not taking the escape pod. I will. Oh. What was that? Oh. That's it. Oh. Get it out. I love how she's sweet and she's like, that's it. Get it all out. But like, you caused this. <laughs> she's like, I like you so much charisma. <laughs> so she, he put his his character points into charisma. He's like super charming, mm -hmm. super able to talk. She put her points into religion and intelligence because she mm -hmm. figured out how to do the chemistry to chemically do charisma on people. Mm -hmm. That tells me like you could be super charming and stuff, but go to the library. Go to the library, figure yeah. out how to do chemistry. Yep. Yeah. Set up your workbench with your chemistry set. Mm -hmm. And learn how to 
make chemicals that take people down. Take people down. Mm-hmm. I mean, she she got him to do what she wanted, right? That's, That's right. charismatic. It's charismatic in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Bel Rios finally takes command of the new fleet. He's heading to the Outer Reach. Uh, but where in the Outer Reach is he going to go? Set a course for the Outer Reach. Okay, so let's... <laughs> if this is the Milky Way, yeah, and the red is the outer reach, it's a third of the Milky Way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that's like being here, here in California, and being set course for the Eastern Hemisphere. Like, like where? Like, that's, a, that's a lot of space. Yeah, that's a lot of space. Plus, I mean, if we're if we're near the core near Trantor, they were looking at like a hundred and twenty degree sweep. Of Huge potential. angle, right? Where do I want? Where do I want to go? Hundred anywhere within this one hundred and twenty degrees. Can you meet, can imagine it. being the pilot and there's this, like, like set a course to the outer reach, like um, mm. <laughs> like anywhere, anywhere near. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, how far do you want to go? I mean, you could go here, close, or way out here, far away. Still in the outer reach. It's it's wildly far from each other. It's like just one third of space, <laughs> just anywhere out there. Anywhere, anyway, send it. Don't it, worry about it. It's also a coordinated jump with all like the other 15, 20 other f- ships in the fleet. Mm-hmm. So like a Homer Mallow ship is like, we're going to the outer reach, and all the other ships are like, wait, where? It's like we're going, to, we're going to the outer reach. Like yeah. I'll see you there. I'll see you there. Yeah. Because what this is, I think this is how what's the diameter of the Milky Way? I think it's like a hundred thousand light years. I think that's right. So this is, we're talking, this is maybe 60 to 80,000 light years here. And then 50,000 light years. Sure. I mean, sure. this is huge. This it's is huge. enormous. Just outer reach. Maybe maybe the outer reach was a lot smaller last time Bell Rios was out of prison. And nobody's willing to question his command. So they're like, okay, we're sending okay, it. Okay, okay, okay. We're going. <laughs> Try my best. <laughs> so interesting. When they decide to jump, is super cool. Super cool space jump. So cool. So I want cool. more of this. I want more of this too. Super I want to. Cool. I want to know more about the rings. I want to know more about their military base. I want to like we've got. Uh, if we go back a little bit. Twenty. Here. Twenty something. Twenty seven. Yeah, all ships. these ships. You know, and they're probably behind us and all over the place. Yeah. It's like a huge fleet. I want to know more. Plus, a single ship itself is huge. Incredible. Crewed and everything. I'd I like would to like to more know more. Yeah. I, guess, I hope coming up we will learn more about Bel Rios and his fleet. This bothered me. So we're on Una's planet. And Harry said that the the mines were abandoned 3,000 years ago. But these robots survive. The technology is incredible. 3,000 right. years without maintenance, without people, in a sandy, grainy, nasty place. Kind of one of the worst environments possible for machinery. Because yeah. the sand, the little grit gets in between the oil seals and it just chews up any rubber. And then you now you get gritty stuff and gears just grinds them apart. Terrible, terrible. Right. And I'm seeing we got these like joints here, joint here. I see some kind of hydraulic. I mean, might not be hydraulic, but I see all kinds of complex parts, moving joints, just and there's sand everywhere. Somehow these robots are able to survive mm-hmm. with well lubricated working joints for 3,000 years. I mean, heck, even power. Where are they getting power That's from? Right. These things were underground for however many, well, however long. Right. And we're, then they're just like up and ready to rock. I guess they have solar panels somewhere, but they have to be maintained. They degrade. Even if they had solar panels, they the so Gail and Gail and Salvar encountered these underground. So they would have been uncharged for however long. Oh no, no they just plug right in. Boop. Boop. There it is. <laughs> They're in a cave. There's no <laughs> are there outlets in the cave for them to plug into? I mean, it, it must be. It must like so so the thing that really bothers me about this is that Sure, maybe there's some tech that works like this where where sand doesn't fuck it up <laughs> and you can save your batteries for thousands of years. But that also means that that tech should exist elsewhere in the galaxy. So so if we encounter machines in sandy environments, they better be perfect. What if they forgot some of this tech? And so from 3,000 years ago, they were able to make the tech. It's working good. 
robots still exist, but today they don't know how to make it. Oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. So, so, so this this planet was a mining planet three thousand years ago. Mm-hmm. At that time, the empire said we want those resources, mm-hmm. and then and then the empire has since moved on. And since mm-hmm. the record keeping from three thousand years ago is kind of it's, it's whatever's painted on the wall, mm-hmm. then they've forgotten that this tech exists. So, okay, okay. Right. And the, the robots don't look super advanced, but I think we're saying if they're three thousand year old, this is advanced. Yeah. Um, but then again, we've seen um, the beggar. Salvor's ship. I mean, it lasted under salt water for quite a while with coral on it and a blast in the side. The, the seat cushions are perfect. Perfect. So maybe that's a, some of the tech we're seeing with this like long lasting, te- complicated technology. Hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep an eye on the tech as we go here. Because the empire is supposed to be in decline and maybe some of the tech will start to degrade. Hmm. Sure. Speaking of tech, Harry comes back to life. He's a pulse. As far as we can tell, he's mm-hmm. human. And this made me think of that cowboy planet from, from the previous episode, maybe okay. two episodes ago, where there was technology going on. But since the people didn't understand the technology, they just had no concept of it. Mm-hmm. They thought it was magic. So so here, at least when I was watching this, I have no idea how a human could come back to life like this. So so it feels like magic to me. And I think at this point, Gale and, and um, Salver don't know how Harry came back. In fact, mm-hmm. Harry doesn't know how he came back. So from their perspective... It looks like magic. It, it looks like it could be magical how he's there. So, I mean, if he's... Okay, so one possibility, he's actually there. Sure. So he's somehow transported through time. Pretty magical. Another one is they build him... They build the AI in the Prime Radiant, a new biological body. Okay. That is exactly the same as Harry Seldon's body. He could also be an intelligent robot that had Harry's memory shoved into it. But he did have a pulse. But, I mean, I, so one question is, does Demerzel have a pulse? Okay, we if she's a robot, she could make a pulse, right? Right, it could fake a pulse. Fake a pulse. Yeah. Sure. But I guess if you stab Harry, yep. it'll be obvious that the insides are non-human. Blue blue blood tech stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, we saw Demerzel get mm-hmm. in a couple mm-hmm. episodes ago. And when her, there was like, there's like circuitry and, right. and weirdness, not blood and bones. But we see, we see, um, in the even in the next picture, like she, Gail asks him, "How are you here?" And he's like, "I don't know." So hopefully, hopefully, we'll find out. Hopefully, we'll find, we'll find out in the upcoming episodes how was he there. Yeah. Until then, I have to say it's it's magical. Right. It's like with with me in this universe, I know exactly how I got here. Yep. Yep. Stork. Okay. Is the stork. The stork did it, right? <laughs> What's that? The stork. The baby stork. Drops you off at the mom. Oh yeah. Because when mommies and daddies, when gay, mama, when mommies and daddies love each other very much, a stork comes in and fucks your mom. You did not call my daddy a later, stork. He's a dork. I'm talking about an actual bird. You're half bird. I'm half bird. Yep. I'm so super, is Harry, I'm super fly. That's right, baby. Is <laughs> Harry really alive? We'll find out in the future episodes. That's right. I mean, when we say alive, do we mean like he's a robot or biological? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, where is the 23rd fleet jumping? He, they said the Outer Reach, but we looked at the map and it's a big fucking region. Are they going to appear right at Terminus or are they going to like go to the closest part of the Outer mm-hmm. Reach and they're going to cut a swath through the planet to like mm-hmm. to like do intimidation stuff? Mm-hmm. I don't know. And then also, how will Hober Mallow solve the impending crisis? Right. It's going to all come, mean, to come to a head. We'll see how this goes. I kind of hope that he doesn't and that it's Bell Reels in, like, indirectly actually solved it. Okay. Not sure how that would go down, but we'll see. I have no idea. I just like Bell Rios. Super cool. Catch you next time. Catch you next time.